The Lord be with you. And, and also with you. Good morning. We're glad that you've led us into your homes and lives with this recorded worship service for June the 14th. If you have not yet prepared your communion elements, you might want to pause this recording and go do that because we will be serving communion during the service. Let us begin with the call to worship. People of God, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love. A great prophet has risen among us. God has looked with favor upon us. and confess our sins. O Lord, Lord our God, God you, you call us to work for a world where all will be fed and have dignity, but, but we find ourselves distracted by our own desires. You call us to seek justice and peace, but we are satisfied with injustice and discord. You call us to bring liberty to the oppressed, but we do not insist on freedom for all. Forgive us, O Lord, and turn us to your will by the power of your Spirit. Amen. Do not fear, says the Lord, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. 
God is doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. By the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 15. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, my Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour. Knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. And then one said, I will surely return to you in due season and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time, I shall return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, oh, yes, you did laugh. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this one day, the Lord God walks up to Abraham's tent. Now, Abraham doesn't know it's the Lord God. He just sees three men. But even three travelers will get a certain welcome from Abraham. The Middle East is really good at this. And Abraham says, sit under the tree in the shade and let me get you a little water. Then he runs and gives Sarah some instructions. You know, hey, Sarah, even though you're 99 years old, please do the following. Mix up and knead and let rise and knead again and bake some cakes for these visitors. I mean, this is a lot of work that he assigns her. I'm just saying, from the woman's point of view, this is a huge task. Then Abraham goes and picks out a calf and slaughters it, and the men get the fire going and they cook it. He makes barbecue for the visitors. He'd said, let me get you some water, but he fixes a feast. And then Abraham sits in the shade and talks with the visiting men while Sarah does all this work with the cakes. And along and along the men say, or maybe it's God who says it, the text is not really all that clear. 
But somebody says, by the way, Abraham, you know, when I come back next year, you'll have a son. And Abraham says, no, no, I'm too old. Sarah's too old. We will not have a child. And Sarah's in the tent listening, and she laughs out loud. God says, no, no, you're not too old. Yes, you will have a child named Isaac, or laughter, because you laughed. Oh, this is quite a promise. And God loves doing this. He, he gives his promises to the most unlikely people all through the scriptures. There's this one. Later, Isaac has two sons, and God chooses the younger one as the heir of the promises, despite his you know, rascally behavior. One time an elder said to me, you know, if God can love a son of a gun like Jacob, maybe there's hope for me. Well, then Jacob has all these children, 12 sons and a bunch of daughters, and God chooses Joseph to be the ruler of Egypt. And all along the way, God provides. He chooses Moses, the murderer, to lead the people and get the law. And years later, King David's grandmother comes from Moab across the Jordan and marries Boaz and starts the line that produces the king. All the way through scripture, God chooses the unlikely ones to fulfill the promise. At one point, Sarah gets tired, decides to make the promise work out by giving Abraham her maid. Have a child with her. Strange to us, but not so strange in Abraham's day. He's a rich tribal leader, and it would be expected that there'd be a lot of people around, a lot of women in his, in his family. So have a child with Hagar and leave me alone. Let him fulfill the promise. Abraham does that, and Ishmael is born, and God takes care of Hagar and Ishmael, but Ishmael is not the child of the promise. No, Sarah, you will bear the child that these visitors prophesied. And the following year, Sarah gives birth at a pretty advanced age. She may not have been too happy about it. Then again, she may have been very happy to have a child. But either way, Sarah and Abraham have this young boy to raise. Now, the Bible likes to foreshadow things. There's another child of the promise, another son that fulfills the promise and a lot of other promises. There's the promise to David that one of his descendants will do all these wonderful things and then sit on his throne forever. A promise of a Messiah to come is repeated over and over in the Bible. And so here we see this foreshadowing of this coming Messiah, Jesus. Jesus is not born of an old woman, but of a rather young one who isn't even married yet, a virgin, who gives birth in strange circumstances on a trip in a stable. And she doesn't laugh at the announcement that she's to have a son She's filled with questions. How can this be? <coughs> but finally, she says to the angel, let it be with me according to your word. And at the appropriate time, Jesus is born. So in all of these promises, we see that God is active and engaged in our world. He brings salvation to us from among us in Jesus. You know, being human, Jesus shares our nature. But being divine, he does it without sin. And so he's the one who can save us, who can conquer death in a way that affects us. And just as Adam sinned and includes us in that, Jesus conquers death and includes us in his actions. So God's promise of salvation for all of us is fulfilled. 
But God's purpose in the long run is not simply to save us and rescue us from sin. God's purpose is to set right in the world all that's gone wrong. He will renew and restore creation so it becomes a new creation. He'll make everything right and new. There'll be justice and love and peace between all creatures, between and among all of us. So symbolically, God comes to Abraham as three people. Now some on the internet interpret this as God and two angels. And you have to believe it if it's on the internet, right? Wrong. It's understood as three men who come to see Abraham. And then the text several times says, the Lord says this or that. Well, if there are three men, where did God come from? The men are angels. They're messengers of God. And in the text, the, translate, the transition from three men to God is so smooth that most interpreters just take the three to represent God, the Trinity. God came and visited Abraham, made his appearance as three men. <coughs> There's a famous Russian icon painted by Andrei Rublev. It's called the Trinity. It's a representation of three men sitting around a table with a house and an oak tree and Mount Sinai in the background. And they sit without any motion as though eternally contemplating peace and love, harmony and humility. They are present to Abraham and Sarah and they're spiritually present to us as well. And if you go to Google and look up Rublev's Trinity, you can see a picture of that icon. The three visitors came to Abraham and Sarah and made a promise. They come to our world and renew the promise made to Abraham. And they do not promise us a son, but they come with the promise of the son, the Messiah, the Savior Jesus. And in the East, icons are not seen as pictures. They're seen as windows into heaven, as windows into the truth. So we see these three sitting in eternal unity and peace with love and humility and harmony. And isn't that what we want? Isn't that what we long for in our world? In our world just now, there's a lot of tension and, and little peace. Every day there are protests across the world demanding, crying out, hoping for, pleading for justice, for a change in the way that people are treated, for a change in the way that black people specifically are treated. And it seems to me that there are th three different ways we could respond. <coughs> The first is the Richard Nixon response. We can pound on the table and demand law and order. And as reasonable as that sounds, it actually perpetuates and strengthens the racism in our world. It puts us in opposition to black people and their cries for justice. Now the second way is to agree that these cries have a point and to go out there and start to tell people how they should behave. Tell the people who are protesting how they should do it, how they should protest, how they should phrase things, what phrases they should use. In short, the second way is to go all white on them. Keeps our institutions and our status quo intact while we expand great energy helping and supporting the movement. The third way that we might respond was expressed very well in an email I was copied on this week from a black pastor in the community who said, well, to get started, read the book White Fragility. 
Watch the movie The 13th or the movie 12 Years Slave. That's a start to understand racism in this country for 400 years. Understand the language of lynching. And then ask yourself, what can I do to create change? Then the next issue is racism in Christianity when it comes to our local churches. As a black female clergy, I've experienced racism and genderism. The places that are supposed to show God's love show hatred because of unbiblical morals, personal piety, power, privilege, and politics. We talk about being an inclusive body, but the black church doesn't have a voice, or the black church voice must use the same language as those sitting around the table. Discussion is good, but the black clergy should lead it. We've led for a long time, and no one's listened until now. That's a good email. And see, we all have to sit and listen and be taught. Now, I posted a YouTube video several days ago about the book White Fragility. It's about an hour and a half. It's a very good lecture by the author of that book, she reads some parts of it and talks about it, challenges us very severely, but it's very entertaining at the same time. The movie 13th talks about the 13th Amendment, which set the slaves free after the Civil War. But the end of that war is not the end of racism. And the movie shows how it changed and evolved over time and still is active in our society. And what they teach us is that the presuppositions we bring to the discussion are mostly well-meaning, but mostly wrong. We have a lot to learn, but we have hope. We have the confidence that God will bring about this promised future. And that in the future, all the races will be treated with equity and justice. And for now, we listen and learn. A couple of other clergy and I are trying to get some discussions going in the local community fairly soon. So stay tuned for news of that. But again, for now, we must trust in God's engagement and God's activity in our world. If God can bring it about that old women and virgins have children, there's no telling what else might happen, what other strange and wonderful things God might do. So hang on. God's laughing, and God gets the last laugh. Thanks be to God. Amen. In the deserts of your life, I'll not desert you. I will make a way beside a flowing stream. Through the valley, do not fear, for I am with you.
We come now to the Lord's table, and it is his table, and he invites all of us to partake of the bread and the juice and the wine. He invites us to do this virtually, so you'll do it at your home, but we'll celebrate it here. And so let us pray. The Lord be with you. And, and also with, with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, we lift them, them to, to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right, right to give our thanks, thanks and praise. praise. Blessed are you, O Lord our God. You've created us all in your own image. You have claimed us all as your beloved people. You've called us to be a blessing for others. And so in so many ways, we bring our praises and join our voices to the song of the heavenly choir that sings, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And blessed is Jesus Christ, our Savior. Jesus called disciples to follow in your way. He fed the hungry and healed the sick. He loved neighbors and welcomed strangers. And remembering your goodness and grace, we offer ourselves to you with gratitude as we share this joyful feast. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so, O God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this bread and this cup and make us one in the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Keep us faithful in your service until peace and justice embrace and all things are new in heaven and on earth and all in heaven and on earth are one. And we pray it through Jesus Christ. Hear us, O God, as we pray the prayer he taught. Our Father, Father, who who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. All of you drink of it. And as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. And so let us partake.
fed us with the bread of life, O Lord, and given us the cup of salvation. Send us forth to be the bearers of your promise, bringing hope to all the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. As you go, may all the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit go with you now and forever. Alleluia. Amen.